Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure for UN women to be here uh, to attend this biggest and most significant event on something that is so critical that sustains life for all, but particularly for women. And uh, as UN Women, we are very pleased also, and we thank the Stockholm International Water Institute for inviting us, but not only that, but making sure that this session, more than any other, and not by accident, I know, because this session deals with, or this conference dealt with water and food security, where women are so intrinsically involved and affected, that they have dedicated this conference so much to exploring and establishing the symbiosis between gender equality, women's empowerment, water security, and food security. And uh, I have had the privilege, of course, of participating in some of the specific uh, panel discussions and, and uh, also getting practitioners from the ground to weigh in on these issues, bring to life the actual experience uh, and good practices and what lessons have been learned in making that connection. Uh, and um, I would like today to um, focus on this issue of gender equality, women's empowerment, water, and, and uh, food security. Our meeting this week in Stockholm and our rich debates are taking place today in the backdrop of severe droughts around the world. And from the worst drought in 56 years in the Midwest of the United States, to Karnataka drought in India, to the protracted drought in the Sahel region of West Africa, we have seen the very concrete con uh, consequences of the nexus between water and food security. And how in a globalized world, something that happens in one part can affect uh, the rest. Also, the impact of the drought in the Midwest has res already resulted in higher prices for corn and soya beans, two of the most important food crops worldwide. In the Sahel, 18.7 million people are facing food insecurity, and more than one million children under the age of five are at the risk of severe acute malnutrition. And women in this region carry the burden of feeding their families, of caring for the infirm and, and uh, the, the starving. These events are a stark reminder of the environmental dimension with direct economic and social consequences. They remind us of the critical linkages between these three dimensions and of the strong connection between water scarcity or availability, affordability and quality, and food security. <clears throat> Today, I would like to highlight the importance of the gender perspective in looking at these connections. Women and girls and the way they are impacted by access to water or lack of it constitutes a large part of the picture and most importantly, a large part of the solution in the nexus between water and food security. They are disproportionately impacted by uh, the burden 
uh, and carry the burden of uh, food and water um, uh, use and, and uh, collection and, at the, and production. And at the same time, they, and this is my proposition, that they are both the beneficiaries and enablers. This is very important. Beneficiaries and enablers of food and water, uh, uh, food and water security future, which has been so emphasized in this conference. Now, I recently returned from Rio Plus 20, where each in their uh, own right, gender equality and women's empowerment, water, uh, water security and water management, and sustainable water management, as well as the issue of food security and agricultural development were identified as priorities for our sustainable future and de development. And in that context, I just want to very quickly read out to you what the Rio Plus 20 outcome says on this. It says that the progressive realization of access to safe and affordable drinking water and basic sanitation for all are necessary for poverty eradication, women's empowerment, and protection of human health. And it also calls for improving the implementation of integrated water resource management at all levels as appropriate and highlights the commitment of the international community to the 2005-2015 International Decade for Action, Water for Life. The Rio outcome document also reaffirms the commitment of the international community to ensure women's equal rights, access, participation, and leadership in the economy, society, and political decision making. It's not only a social issue, gender equality and women's empowerment, but it's also an economic and an environmental uh, issue. It stresses the need to ensure that le their leadership and effective participation in sustainable development policies, programs, and decision-making at all levels. And this includes, of course, in water and food security. And also, in the context of food security, it reiterates the importance of empowering rural women as critical agents for enhancing agriculture and rural development, food security, and nutrition, and equal access to productive and economic resources is also emphasized, which, as you know, is essential in the context of access to water, and I will elaborate on that a little later. So therefore, this connection is already made in the Rio Plus 20 outcome. But why am I mentioning Rio Plus 20? Because Rio Plus 20 outcome also agreed that as we come to the period that marks the end of, well, the end or the fulfillment, hopefully, of the Millennium Development Goals, a new set of goals, the Sustainable Development Goals, are to be launched. And I want to strongly give the message here, and this is something from Rio, that the three priorities of gender equality, women's empowerment, water, and food security must be very strongly interlinked in evolving the three SDGs in, in each of the areas, and that each must have, the water SDG must have a very strong indicator and targets on uh, gender equality, women's empowerment, as must food security uh, uh, SDG. And in that context, what is to be emphasized is the issue. The SDG on, on water really would be 
looking at issues of efficiency of use, you know, the sustainable consumption and production patterns that is so emphasized and so vividly brought forward by the posters out there. One hamburger uses up 2,400 liters of water. So that kind of, those kind of issues. What is sustainable consumption and production? And then the issue of pollution and, and re uh, renewability, the issue of protection of ecosystem, uh, and uh, the issue of access and affordability. And uh, so this, this is what the water uh, SDG will have to address. So in that context, how would you address gender equality and women's empowerment? And we are, our initial thoughts on this are, and we are developing as UN Women some of the substantiation for this. And of course, through evidence base, because eventually there has to be some element of measurability, some element of monitoring and evaluation, and also a pathway to reach there. So what we would, what we would like to see in terms of gender targets, in terms of gender indicators, in an SDG on water is women's full participation in water governance. Then uh, addressing women's needs, women's and girls' needs. Elevating their work burden and having gender sensitive infrastructure and services. So these are, I would say, some commandments on uh, gender equality and women's empowerment that need to be part of the water Bible that will be um, established as part of the SDG. And we very much hope that Sweden, as a leader on the issue of water, as well as on gender equality and women's empowerment, and the Minister of Development Cooperation, she is on the high-level panel of the Secretary General of the UN on, uh, on post-2015 development agenda, uh, which includes work on SDGs, will be one of the promoters of this idea and, and this interrelationship. Now, why I know that sometimes to many, most of us, this connection between women and uh, their rights and their empowerment uh, and equality and non-discrimination um, is very evident. It's obvious. But for many others, it still uh, remains to be uh, made more visible and, and clear. So I just want to uh, highlight what the connections are. Water is used for a wide range of activities, all of which have a bearing on gender equality and women's empowerment. In the household, for drinking, cleaning, conservation, storage, and preparation of crops and food, for instance, in developing countries, most women's survival strategies for lifting themselves and their families out of property, uh, poverty through preparing and selling of food takes place in the household. Cottage industries that use water are located in the household and that involve women. Then, current estimates have shown that 70% of the world's water is needed for agriculture, 20% for industry, 10% for personal use, and all these, although these dimensions are interrelated as agriculture and industrial use of water also affects personal and household use, women's access to water in these sectors is much less and I will illustrate that a little later. Because if you just look at agriculture, they are more dependent on unirrigated, rain-fed agriculture. They are smallholder farmers. Also, in industry, they uh, ba basically are most uh, prominent in the small and medium enterprises. So there is, and then women are also uh, amongst the majority of the poor. And there is an increased feminization of poverty. So whether it is in the urban slums or whether it is in the rural areas, including remote areas, 
they are the ones who are most disproportionately affected. <clears throat> and this jeopardizes, of course, the achievement of their human rights, because we have, I think, through these conferences over the years, affirmed that water is a human right, and women's rights are human rights. The recently issued MDG 2012 report points out that while the MDG target has been largely met, 783 million people still remain without access to an improved source of drinking water, and gap between urban and rural areas still remains wide, with the number of people in rural areas without an improved water source five times greater than in urban areas. And on reducing hunger too, although strides have been made, we know that not only is it a question of covering all those that are still hungry, some 800 million people, but also uh, pro pre uh, preventing a backslide as every food crisis that we see to 2008 and now I don't know whether we are hurtling into one. So that is one of the big challenges. So in all of this, um, also, a 2012 MDG report highlights, and this is where the connection comes in, that in sub-Saharan Africa, 71% of the water collection burden falls on women and girls. And it's true of South Asia, it's true of many other parts of the world. And it is estimated that in, that in sub-Saharan Africa, women spend more than 200 million hours per day collecting water. So, the linkages between water and food security are the most significant in the context of gender and women, uh, women's empowerment in the following ways. Firstly, we have gendered patterns of production with women dominating subsistence and rain-fed agriculture, as I mentioned before, and unpaid water collection tasks, while men dominate the cash crops. And then the land rights are 90% of the land rights are with men, with only 10% with women, and land rights are often linked to water rights. And we have to decouple that. Then the whole issue of gender entitlement systems and discrimination in access and control over water. That's why we need to address this. Due to various gender norms and behavior and social relations, women and girls have restricted access to productive resources such as water, land, agriculture inputs, finance and credit, extension services and technology, which in turn limits the efficiency of the agricultural sector to deliver food security for all. For instance, poor women, rural women, women in post uh, uh, peri urban areas, women farmers, and um, have often been denied access to water source due to social constructs, such as class, ethnicity, and cultural constraints in the community, and it is often an issue of intersectional discrimination as well, like indigenous peoples and, and, and other uh, categories. Then there is, of course, this gender division of labor. Entrenched gender roles means that women and girls often bear the brunt of associated hardships as growers and processors of food, responsible for the nutrition of their family and water collectors. They spend a disproportionate number of hours on labor-intensive, time-consuming, and unpaid domestic tasks, such as fetching water and firewood, because there is a very strong energy connection to water and food production, and um, washing dishes and clothes, and preparing meals. This leads to their drudgery, reducing their opportunities to education, decent work, political engagement, and perpetuating the intergenerational, this is very important, 
perpetuating the intergenerational transfer of poverty and disempowerment. Then if you're looking at the governance issue, there again we see the gendered patterns of governance and leadership. Although women carry most of the water-related tasks, play a key role in food production, especially in subsistence farming, and perform most of the unpaid care work, their participation in decision-making on water and food management remains very low. And that's why we emphasize that as a very important gender indicator in the water SDG. In 2012, women held less than 6% of all ministerial positions in the field of environment, natural resources, and energies. Only 6%. The combined impacts of the recent economic and financial crisis, volatile energy and food prices, and climate change have exacerbated water and food scarcity and their detrimental impact on women and girls. So, what is the solution? How do we approach this? Firstly, we have to recognize women are an important part of the solution. As much as we aim to relieve their burden and to give them opportunities, but in whatever we do in terms of sustainable water management, sustainable agriculture and food security, quest, we must include a very strong gender equality, women's empowerment dimension. If we want to succeed, we need to recognize women as water resource engineers, managers, farmers, and irrigators who contribute to ensuring sustainable food production and consumption, safeguarding the environment. And, and mind you, that's why they are called Earth Mothers that they are, they are really natural conservers. And water resources within the households and communities. Secondly, we need to increase our efficiency in managing food and water resources, ensuring that women are empowered along the water and food supply chain. So not only managing the demand side of it, but also the supply chain. This involves recognizing women as independent users of water and enabling women to access water rights regardless of land ownership. Support women's food production systems and value chains, including in adaptation and mitigation of climate change. Alleviate women and girls' unpaid work burden associated with water collection, food production, and processing and care work. Improve infrastructure services for women, especially poor women in the urban areas and rural women. It has been proven that improvements in infrastructure services, especially water and electricity, can help free up women's time spent on domestic and care work. Consider this. Electrification in rural South Africa, for instance, has increased women's labor force participation by about 9%. In Bangladesh, it has led to more leisure time for women and increasing welfare. It's not only that you release women from the burden so that you know, they can go and work elsewhere. It is also that they can increase the welfare of women. In Pakistan, putting water sources closer to home was associated with increased time allocated to productive market work. In Tanzania, a survey found that girls' school attendance was 25% higher for girls from homes located 15 minutes away or less from a water source than in homes one hour or more away. So these are you know, the opportunity costs that women have to wear if, if you don't have that access and which would otherwise be uh, giving us dividends in terms of better education and empowered women. We must also address the multifaceted gender discriminations in assessing and controlling productive resources such as water and land, assets and services. 
Evidence suggests that investing in women-owned food and agricultural enterprises could narrow the resource gap and increase agricultural yields. Potentially, I think you must have heard this FAO finding that if women were to have the same access to agricultural services, ex including extension services, irrigation services, and, and technical services, then the, the productivity and the agricultural yields would go up by as much as 15 to 20 percent, and the number of hungry people reduced by 100 to 150 million. So again, harness this power, this woman power, by giving them equal access to productive resources. Um, and for this, we need to provide technical training on water management, irrigation, rainwater harvesting, other smallholder irrigation technologies, and rain-fed agriculture. For, in, for in, uh, instance, in South Africa, Lesotho, and Uganda, women ministers for water are implementing affirmative action programs in the water sector to train women for water and sanitation-related careers, including science and engineering. At local level, women have found their voices and have now been trained to locate water sources in the village, decide on the location of facilities, that is the, the empowering and ownership, and repair pumps. So improving water supply services to cover the needs of the poorer sections of the population by initiating reforms, and these are very important in the urban areas also, that make water affordable to the poor families in rural, urban, and peri-urban areas, such as installment schemes for connection charges and subsidies. It is indeed common knowledge that the poorest, the majority of whom are women, have less access to safe drinking water and pay more for their water usage. And I think this has been referred to earlier in this conference. And then, of course, uh, we have already talked about the productive resources. We need to leverage the voice, participation, and influence of women in managing the sustainable use of water resources and food and sharing benefits equally. And yesterday, where we had this panel on global practices from the different regions that were brought uh, to bear on the policy issues, there was an emphasis on what is needed as an ecosystem of policies. You need an enabling environment, you need institutions, you need targeted programs and special measures, you need human resource capacity building, you need the systems in place, and you need also sectoral policies, including energy and other policies to bring it all together. And the action must be taken at the global level, regional, and national level. And all actors and stakeholders have to be involved. But women's agency has to be built through women's organizations, self-help groups, cooperatives being strongly supported. And this is a message not only for governments, but also for uh, development cooperation partners and donors that they have to prioritize this in their budgets, in their aid allocation. And lastly, I just want to um, emphasize the importance of targets and indicators, of monitoring and evaluation, and um, we, we should not use measurability as an excuse for not having gender equality and women's empowerment inclusion in all water and agriculture policies and, um, and, and their evaluation and their implementation. Uh, I would also like to end by recalling that the Human Development Report of the UNDP in 2006 said that throughout history, water has confronted humanity with some of its greatest challenges. Water is a source of life, as a natural resource, and sustains our environment and supports livelihood. But it is also a source of risk and vulnerability. In the early 21st century, prospects for human development, which includes 
Women's development are threatened by a de uh, deepening global water crisis. Debunking the myth that the crisis is a result of scarcity. The report argues that poverty, power, and inequality are at the heart of the problem. And that is why, and that is why, gender equality and women's empowerment must be the part of any blue revolution that we are seeking to launch and any green revolution or the, the second generation, latest generation green revolution that we seek to launch. Thank you very much.